Hello, my name's Cecily. Uh, and firstly, I just want to say I'm really happy to be here. I've really enjoyed all the talks this morning. They've been pretty exciting and inspiring. Um, and so I'm just going to talk a little bit about what Teatro Mundi is. We're a research charity, but we're basically set up to bridge um, the gap between the worlds of kind of architecture and planning and uh, performers, artists, musicians, and writers. Uh, and the project that I'm going to talk about today is called Urban Backstages. Uh, our research basically focuses on sites of cultural production and uh, the infrastructures that support them. So, starting with a very basic question, what is infrastructure? Um, and so in kind of the physical terms, it's like the, you know, in terms of like engineering, it's, it's the support system that helps buildings stand up, but it's also the kind of invisible networks and systems that essentially make stuff work. And cultural infrastructure is a term that is becoming uh, increasingly fashionable um, uh, for city governments in terms of uh, cultural regeneration programs. Um, but they often kind of take the, the approach of investing in big kind of flashy landmark projects uh, like the museum, the theatre and the gallery. Um, and, and these are the kind of spaces where culture is consumed and displayed. Um, and, you know, it, in terms of kind of funding opportunities it makes sense and I'm not trying to kind of argue that these projects shouldn't happen but there's a bit of a disparity between the kind of money that goes into these large flashy projects and what we're calling the urban backstage um, we call this the urban stage because in the metaphor of like the city as theatre uh, it's the kind of place where the sort of display and perform performance of culture happens but the urban backstage we're kind of arguing is all of the kind of unseen sites of production uh, where things are made, rehearsed, um, experimented on, failure happens. Uh, and I'm not just talking about the kind of physical spaces that these things take place in, but I'm also talking about the kind of organisational and social structures that support them. So, for example, with the orchestra, it's not just um, the physical space, but it's also where the instruments are made and the kind of social groups that support the orchestra, you know, getting to the best it can be, like the kind of youth orchestra and the community choir. Okay. And we've basically uh, organised these activities into three different categories, infrastructures of making, which we're kind of using broadly to kind of term everything from the uh, one-off artisan maker, like a ceramicist, up to kind of industrial scale making. Uh, infrastructures of performance, which is pretty self-explanatory, I think. Uh, and infrastructures of virtual, so the kind of writing and the production of knowledge. And our research project takes um, place across four cities in two different countries, London, Glasgow, Paris and Marseille. And we focused on one capital city and one secondary city. And we're essentially looking at kind of case studies of production sites within these cities, trying to kind of understand them within the specific context of that city. So today I'm going to be talking about railway arches in the London uh, neighbourhood of Elephant and Castle. And so just to kind of give a little bit of background information about um, you know, London's approach to planning for culture, this is the Mayor's um, cultural infrastructure map. And already you can see a kind of slightly more nuanced approach to um, categorizing here. They've basically made a big interactive map of all of the, all of the different spaces um, that kind of culture is produced. Uh, and whilst these kind of maps are really useful because they kind of signpost what's there. What we're really interested in, I suppose, is uh, what are the underlying conditions that allow these spaces to exist? Uh, okay, so I'm going to be talking specifically about railway arches in Elephant and Castle. Um, the railways were kind of originally constructed in 1833 um, and basically they formed a kind of physical infrastructure because, you know, the terrain in London was sort of marshy and boggy. But as a result, there was this kind of leftover spatial typology uh, underneath the railway arch, which was essentially rolled out on a mass scale across London. And so I guess the question was what to do with these leftover spaces. Uh, this kind of shows a early experimentation into putting housing under there. And I guess for obvious reasons, this didn't really work out because of sort of noise, pollution. Um, yeah, not a good idea. But in more recent times, with kind of mass speculation and uh, you know rising house prices and the housing crisis, we see these kind of ideas resurfacing uh, in a kind of slightly ominous way. Luckily, been cracked down on. <laughs> 
Um, but for the most part, uh, the type of production that goes on within the rail p railway arches, they, they've, they've kind of become a refuge for the sort of more messy, dirty trades that otherwise would be kind of pushed to the perimeters of the city. And I suppose what we're trying to ask is why? What are the conditions that s safeguard these spaces in a kind of infrastructural uh, frame of thinking? Uh, the first one, benign neglect. Essentially, they're a huge asset that's owned by Network Rail, so they're under public ownership. And this means that because essentially for Network Rail, uh, the main kind of e economic generator for them is the railways, the sub subsidiary kind of um, nature of the spaces beneath means that it's a kind of, it's, they're not that kind of bothered about, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's just a kind of byproduct, I suppose, which, which has meant that essentially the railway arches remain incredibly affordable and that intervention from the landlord is minimal. Uh, fragmentation, so essentially because they're sort of segre segregated and tiny, like in little constrained plots, even though they have a kind of massive combined mass, um, they can never fully be controlled by one landowner. And so what this has meant that is that kind of their inhabitation has been spread between many hands, and it means that they they're kind of great foothold for kind of small micro businesses. Planning loopholes, because they're under 500 meters squared, um, essentially you don't need a planning application to do, any kind of, to do any kind of adaptations to them. So there's a lot of kind of flexibility there. And also you can kind of change the use class, which means that you can have anything from a brewery to a dance studio to a skate park. And then the last one is undesirable ecology. So as mentioned before, when we were talking about their kind of viability for housing, um, there's issues with light, noise, and temperature. And while we're not trying to kind of argue that cultural producers should make do with substandard spaces, um, actually, s sometimes there can be a kind of beneficial pairing with what happens above and what happens below. So, for example, with kind of music rehearsal spaces or skate parks where you're kind of creating a lot of noise, the noise of the railway doesn't bother them, and they kind of benefit from not having neighbors to disturb. Okay. So now we're on to Elephant and Castle. So I'm just going to talk about like three different typologies of rail watch within the London neighbourhood of Elephant and Castle. Uh, yep, so they're all in a kind of contiguous line, all next to each other, which is helpful for when you're doing research and you don't want to walk very far. Um, and just to give a bit of background context to Elephant and Castle, it's an area that's undergoing rapid regeneration. You probably know about the Haygate estate, but if you don't, it's, it was a notorious 1960s estate, which was essentially sold off by the council for less than its demolition cost. So a huge kind of mismanagement of funding there. And, and essentially, the original, the original estate had 1,194 socially rented apartments. And the new plan has 2,500 new homes, only 74 of which are social housing. So it's like, you know, on, one, on the one hand, it's like, it's essentially social cleansing, which is terrible, but also the kind of economic mismanagement of funding, but of, of kind of money by the council is also pretty shocking. Um, and in a similar vein, uh, the Elephant and Castle Shopping Centre, also built in the 1960s, over the last 30 years was allowed to kind of, through neglect, and was, was allowed to degrade. Um, it was kind of, revitalized and taken over by the local um, Latin American community. So at the moment, there are a lot of little kind of micro businesses. Um, it was sold off to the same developer that regenerated the Haygate Estate. Uh, and in the new development, there's a none of the Latin American businesses have been offered new space. So it's kind of the same story happening again. OK, now I get to have a little break because I've got a film, which is good. So this film is about, I'll let it play. I choose this uh, location to open my business because this is a Latino area. We are a very close community here. We get on well, everyone. 
maybe they're gonna ask us to move from here. So this is very uncertain what is gonna happen in future. I'm very glad to, to have the opportunities that this country has given me because being a foreigner is very hard. But yes, I think uh, I made it. The Elephant and Castle is a big community, Latin American community. I think it's all together in, in the same place. I have different restaurants, cafe, coffee shops. It's more easy maybe for another people when maybe not speak English. It's more easy communication with another person speaking Spanish. I think it's all together is our big family. The great thing about these types of workspaces for us is that it allows for a really soft kind of expansion. I run a small practice that specializes in working with historic buildings, but usually for contemporary minded clients. A lot of our work is in central London. Quick access to that is really important. The strange thing about sharing the workspace is that uh, a sense of community isn't really automatic. If we want to create professional or social relationships, it's something which we do need to contrive ourselves. It's a very vibrant, dynamic place. There's a lot of change happening. There's a lot of small businesses, lots of art students. So the cafe area is a real kind of sort of hub. There are a lot of opportunities that come out of being here. And people have shows, there's sometimes gigs on. Um, interested in public conscience, literature, film, and kind of interpreting narratives from those ideas, is, which is what I kind of work with. We found it very difficult to find this industrial unit because, as you know, London is always developing. Flats and shops are being put up everywhere, but we found that industrial areas were sort of being taken away. We supply audiovisual equipment for events, AGMs, conferences and exhibitions. The location is very important because most of the companies we work with are based in central London and require support daily and sometimes um, quite urgently, so we need to be local to them. I have to pause it here because we're moving on to other case studies. Um, I'm now going to speak in a little bit more detail about the three different case studies that were presented in the film. So the first one is Maldonado Walk, which is a series of eight arches which kind of absorbs the sort of spell out from the shopping centre of uh, Latin American businesses. Um, in terms of visibility, uh, because essentially these spaces are self-built, um, and they have limited access to building materials, uh, there's not very much visibility in terms of like being able to see in um, because they rely on kind of breeze, breeze block construction. And so they rely very heavily on kind of signage to you know, demonstrate that they're there. Uh, and they exist right next to 44 storey tower, uh, strata tower. Um, so they're right on the kind of coal face of regeneration in the area. Um, the kind of organizational structure, one lead tenant, in this case it's the uh, money transfer supply suppliers, uh, will rent the arch and then there'll be a kind of, they'll, they'll subdivide it and sublet it to uh, tenants. Uh, and the, the bit, a lot of the businesses within the arch um, have a kind of social, social agenda as, as well as kind of, you know, be, business. Uh, this is a kind of cafe that offers adv legal advice to recent migrants as well as food. Uh, and the kind of post boxes here essentially provide people with a kind of permanent address who have just moved to the country. And they're really intensively used. So within, within this one arch, you can buy baby clothes, go, go to a bakery, there's tropical juices, and a jewelry maker and hairdressers. And so there are kind of active uses within here, like jewelry making and baby clothes making happening, but this probably wouldn't show up on a kind of GLA, cultural infrastructure map. <laughs> 
but we're arguing this is still kind of cultural production and it's important. They're incredibly intensively used um, and basically the kind of construction of what happens in inside is sort of negotiated through need uh, and so they so it, it kind of because they've had to kind of negotiate space uh, it builds a very kind of strong community with um, uh, a lot of kind of uh, a sort of what's the word symbiotic relationship between different businesses so for example the cafe here there they order food uh, they order the kind of food supplies but then that's distributed to different uh, businesses along the arch and so it's yeah it's, it, it feels like a kind of it's very kind of tightly knit the second one I'm going to speak about is Spare Street. So out of the three examples, this is the only example that's received any kind of public funding. It re it's received Arts Council funding, funding from Southwark Council, and funding from the GLA Good Growth Fund. Um, and it's the only example that has a management company, um, which is called Hotel Elephant. And this is a more kind of traditional co-working and artist studio space. And as a result, um, the significant uh, investment has been put into the construction uh, compared to Mal Maldonado Walk. This is the only one that's been architect designed. And as you see through the, from the kind of totally glazed facade, um, which has been done for practical reasons of getting light in, but also to kind of advertise that there are, as a kind of branding strategy to advertise artists are working here. And also significant investment has been made in, uh, in developing the kind of public realm. They created a new street as part of this initiative. So this is the kind of sort of more developmentally friendly type of um, use which kind of fits well into kind of the, the council sort of wider placemaking agenda. Um, it kind of operates on a uh, Robin Hood type <laughs> uh, arrangement where the co-working spaces, this is an architect, the architect's office within the co-working space subsidise the artist's studios next door. Um, but they're much less intensely used. Um, when we visited, th at the time that we kind of visited to conduct our research, only three spaces were actively being used. Uh, and the kind of, it's essentially sort of a plug and go, and go environment where all of the architecture and the um, furniture is supplied, so they ha they haven't had to kind of build it through the, the kind of sort of same sort of community cohesion that happens at Maldonado Walk, and as a result, it has a much higher turnover, uh, and that's 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 kind of due to also there being a kind of one one month rolling contract of kind of the rental agreement, uh, which which sort of in in one sense is good in terms of like for small businesses who want to kind of grow, it it, it provides flexibility, but it's also quite pre precarious. <coughs> the last one I'm going to talk about is Robert Dashwood Way, and this is a, a set of 21 arches, and it's basically part of an industrial estate. The kind of uses that go on within the arches here, uh, you saw the kind of uh, audio-visual company, but there's also uh, the theatrical prop making, there's a fashion atelier, and then the more kind of um, traditional industri like industrial manu manufacturing uses and auto repair. Oh, and, they, and, and as you can kind of see from this image, they want no kind of visibility from the street. This is partly to do with that they don't really rely on kind of passing footfall and partly to do with often they're kind of storing expensive equipment, so they don't really want to advertise that from the street. Um, and there's been no investment in the public realm, uh, and that's to, to do for kind of practical reasons because it's mainly used for kind of loading and unloading. Uh, this was the audiovisual company that were, w we saw in the film, and I guess one of their their main reasons for inhabiting the arches is one because it's really affordable. Um, they rent directly from Network Rail, and so essentially they rent it as a shell, and they've done all the fit out themselves. Um, but two because of the central location, because as he said in the video, they kind of supply a lot of London's major cultural institutions, and so they need to kind of get there very quickly. Uh, as a result, I mean, like on the on the flip side, actually, the kind of arch spatial typology really doesn't suit the t kind of work that goes along, uh, goes on in here, um, because essentially the kind of arched ceilings limit how much kind of storage you can have, and also this company inhabits like four arches, and so they have to waste a lot of time moving equipment between different arches, which is quite tedious and not very efficient. Okay, so a little kind of comparison in terms of. Um, rental prices, it costs 
double over double the amount to rent in spare street this is due to kind of you know prior investment in terms of architecture and and the kind of furniture but also because there's a management company and you're essentially kind of buying into a creative community i suppose whether it's robert dashwood way is the cheapest because you're, you're you're just renting a shell from ne directly from network rail uh, and these diagrams kind of just demonstrate the sort of relationship between kind of getting access to the space and funding and, and essentially just show that, you know, there's been sig significant fun funding for Spare Street. Uh, we sort of covered this before, infrastructural conditions, so the material, immaterial and ecological. Uh, in terms of visibility, Maldonado Walk could probably do with a bit more visibility from the street. Uh, but due to the kind of construction techniques available to them, you know, they have to make do. Uh, Spare Street, the activities are very much put on show as part of the branding strategy, whether it's Robert Dashwood Way, they don't want to be visible and it's not advantageous for them to be visible. Stability, so yep, as mentioned before, uh, Maldonado Walk, because there's one kind of lead tenant that takes on the, the lease of the space, uh, the rest is kind of done as an informal agree agreement, really. So, you know, it's done quite informally through word of mouth. Uh, with Spare Street, you have one month rolling uh, payments. And then for Robert Dashwood Way, because they're renting from Network Rail, some of them had like 15 year leases, which is which is really good if you're you know, trying to establish a business. Uh, determinacy, so this is more about design. So as mentioned before, Maldonado Walk um, was essentially adapted over time through sort of you know, mediation between the kind of community groups. Uh, Spare Street was purpose designed in a single gesture for a particular moment, and Robert Dashwood Way has kind of been adapted just for sort of practical uses, I suppose. Uh, and so, you know, what what's the future for, for the cultural producers within the railway arches and, you know, following patterns of regeneration in London, it looks pretty bleak. So on September uh, the 10th, 2019, Network Rail sold off all of its railway arches for 1.5 billion to uh, private development company Blackstone and Trillium. And it's projected that the rent pr rental prices will uh, rise by 54% in the next three years. And so for the kind of different types of cultural producers inhabiting these spaces, it looks pretty bleak. And I guess what we're trying to say is, you know, not that one type of production is better than the other, but you need a kind of, for, for a kind of vibrant um, cultural life in the city, you need a diverse range of different producers happening. And, and there needs to be space provided for, you know, all different types of practices. Um, and so wh what do we do? Well, I'm going to end on a couple of questions, uh, which I'm going to read out. So I'm sorry if it sounds a bit stiff, but the questions are, one, can we broaden the definition of what con constitutes culture beyond co-working to encompass the cultural production of migrant communities and the vital supplies of institutions? Two, can we understand their contribution beyond purely economic terms? And three, can we use this knowledge to create the conditions for culture, focusing on the backstage rather than the flashy landmark projects? Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you.